So I'm here with Paul Fletcher, Minister for Communication, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Peter. Good to be with you. Very excited to have you speaking at the event on behalf of the government. Looking forward in, to it. In your new portfolio. Sure. Not so new now, but certainly um, uh, what a career it's been and a trajectory. Uh, when I first met you in the late 90s, you were Richard Austin's senior advisor. That's right. Was the yes. role. Well, one of your senior advisors, yes, that's right. Yeah. And uh, of course, it's been a long history since then. And uh, I just thought we'd chat a little bit about um, what the highlights have been for you in this journey as Australia approaches the 30-year mark. And well, look, I'd say a couple of things. Firstly, um, I did an MBA in the US from 93 to 95. When I left Australia, uh, Telstra was 100% government owned. Uh, the only, about the only mobile service that anybody really had was the Telstra AMP service. GSM had started, but hardly anybody had it. Um, there was no subscription TV, and there was certainly no consumer internet. So the first I really heard about the internet was at, at, at business school in the US, um, taking a class called Management of Media Information and Communications told to go away and look at the uh, University of Minnesota site and Gopher and right. learning a bit about file transfer protocol. But this was all before browsers. What year would this have that been? That was 93, 94. Very early. Yeah. So at that stage, the internet was very much a specialised resource for researchers, for academics. There were no browsers. It didn't have a consumer presence. Mm. So coming back to Australia, 95, started working for Richard Austin after the uh, coalition came to power in 96. And I remember that one of the key complaints we were facing at the time from uh, farmers in particular was for dial-up internet, uh, you had to uh, make a phone call. Right. Uh, if you're in the bush, it was usually a time, time local call. call. Yeah. And the speeds they were getting, we would get complaints that people were getting 1.2 or 2.4 kilobits a second. Mm. Uh, that's you know only a bit over 20 years ago. Mm. Now, through that time, of course, Telstra and Optus were rolling out their HFC networks and the internet was very rapidly developing in Australia and elsewhere as a consumer proposition, as a mass market proposition. Right. At that stage, the search engines were, uh, you know, Ask Jeeves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Look Smart. Yeah. Look Smart was, you know, the Aussie company that was taking on the world. Right. Uh, so things were moving very quickly in the late 90s and certainly in Australia the story of the internet and its mass market adoption is also the story of uh, the internet service providers, uh, Aussie Mail yes. uh, made very big changes, um, Telstra um, uh, as an incumbent was trying to kind of manage the growth. They didn't want it to grow too quickly. Mm -hmm. It was caught up in telco competition. And at the same time, we start to see Australian businesses uh, growing and identifying particular segments where they could come up with a new online-based business model right. and uh, uh, seek, um, uh, domain, realestate.com.au, uh, all of these businesses in Australia, and we had analogous businesses obviously around the world, um, started to really take advantage of the way that the internet allowed a near ubiquitous, extremely low cost uh, connectivity, mm. and at the same time, the number of consumers taking advantage of that just jumped and jumped and jumped and jumped every year. And so, it was really um, the, the technology opened up extraordinary possibilities and in Australia and around the world, uh, consumers and businesses just leapt on that. Of course, at various points, you had things like the, uh, the, the tech crash of 2001. Um, I remember I left government, went to work for Optus, then a subsidiary of cable and wireless, um, you know, received some uh, shares in cable and wireless under the employee share scheme, 17 pounds, fantastic. <laughs> a year later, I think they were at about 80 pence because <laughs> um, the cable and wireless uh, story was about, you know, riding the global internet boom and right. being the backbone around the world. Mm. That story sounded great in 2000. In 2001, it wasn't so popular. Of course, that was the time of, of pets.com and um, all, all of those... Uh, uh, that rush of 
early IPOs of business cases that when that weren't necessarily as as actually dependent on the internet as they suggested. Mm -hmm. So all of this extraordinary flourish of activity, but it just kept coming year after year after year. A uh, number of subscribers uh, in Australia grew and grew and grew. Um, and then you can look at some other really significant milestones. The, the arrival of the smartphone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember in, uh, in about 2004, the hot phone was the Motorola Razr. Mm -hmm. So even in 2004, we were really, we hadn't arrived at the time when people expected that a mobile device was what was going to give you internet connectivity. 2007, uh, the, the, uh, the iPhone comes out in the US. I remember being in the US at the end of 2007, buying a first generation iPhone back to Australia, found somebody to help me do what needed to be done to get it onto a network in Australia. Mm. Uh, and I remember I'd left Optus by that time, but I remember I was do still doing some consultancy work with Optus. Somebody told me by mid 2008, there were 50,000 iPhones on the Optus network in Australia, mm. even before the iPhone had officially, officially launched. launched. And of course, the iPhone, Samsung Galaxy, the smartphones then changed the game completely right. because um, now the device you carried with you at all times gives you connectivity. Mm. That's changed behaviour enormously. And one thing I've noticed, uh, having come into politics and doing a lot of work on uh, regional and, and rural uh, mobile uh, rollout, the mobile mm. black spot scheme, mm. did a lot of community meetings in country towns in 2013, right. 2014. For a lot of people, uh, a smartphone, that's how they think about getting online. It's the lifeline. It is. Right. And if you ask people in, in those meetings, I'd ask people, who's got a PC at home? Mm. Most people would not have a PC, mm. but they had a smartphone. So again, I, I point to that 2007 development as a really fundamental change. And then, of course, certainly in the consumer space, the very big change since uh, 2009 has been uh, the NBN and the, the continued rollout of the NBN. Mm. So, look, everybody will have their own uh, stories of how the internet has just absolutely transformed not just our economy but our society. Mm. Uh, but certainly in Australia, we've always been a nation of early adopters and we've definitely... Um, We've definitely done that with the internet. And I think one thing about the internet that's been particularly significant for Australia is that for so long, we were a country that it was, it was at the end of the world when it came to when new books got released, for right. example, or when uh, movies arrived. And then suddenly the internet meant we could get it when everybody else mm -hmm. got it. And I, I instanced, you know, uh, Australians enthusiastically um, using iPhones in Australia well before they're actually sold here. Mm. I mean, um, we've seen the same thing with Netflix. Mm -hmm. You know, there were plenty of people using Netflix before, before they, it was here. Before yeah. they, it was yeah. officially here. So, yeah. you know, for Australia, the internet has a particular significance in terms of breaking down um, uh, the tyranny of distance. Uh, Francis Cancross wrote that book in the... When was it? It was... Um, I guess in the late 90s, uh, The Death of Distance, mm -hmm. which is a pretty good early take on, on the internet and its significance. And I think for countries like Australia, the internet has a particular significance that it perhaps doesn't have for, uh, say, the US or Europe. Right, which were always self-contained and had the critical mass mm -hmm. and not the sense of isolation yes. and the cultural cringe that we've been yeah. carrying since forever. Paul, I wanted to... Um, return, I think, to some of the policy issues, mm -hmm. uh, which is where I first engaged with you in the late 90s. And um, obviously, you know, you de you've described beautifully the, the revolution as it's occurred, you know, at a technical and at a market level. But of course, it came with uh, other challenges, mm -hmm. that brought challenges that had never been contemplated before. We talk about um, the breakdown of the geographic isolation, but of mm -hmm. course, with that comes a potential loss of sovereignty yes. around um, whose laws should apply. And I was involved, you might recall, the Gutnick case in yes. the, the early 2000s where the High Court had to pronounce on uh, where jurisdiction began and ended with, uh, in that case, defamatory content. Uh, but I, 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 
as, as an industry representative, of course, we were the interface between uh, industry and many of them disruptive mm -hmm. by, by nature, and, and the government where we were trying to, you know, hopefully perform a constructive role as an intermediary in that discussion. But I always had a lot of sympathy for the people, the bureaucrats and, and the policy makers within government. How do, you, how do you grapple with a technology which is so fundamentally disruptive and still meet you, the mandate that you, you're forced to, to, to implement on behalf of the people? Tell us a little bit about your sort of your memories mm -hmm. around some of those difficult policy challenges and, and perhaps... Look, look it's, a, it's a fascinating issue. And what I would say is that in the late 90s, governments, including the Australian government, did not feel very confident mm. about our capacity to regulate online activity. And indeed, there was a strong strand of philosophical opinion, particularly coming from the tech uh, community in the US, mm. which was the internet should be free of regulation. It should be a zone beyond government. Mm -hmm. That might have been plausible when it was a specialist resource used by a relatively small number of academics and researchers. Mm. It became completely untenable as soon as the internet became a mass market consumer phenomenon. Mm. Citizens, without even thinking about it, simply assume that when they're engaging online, they will have the protections of the rule of law as they do when they're engaging in the physical town square. We expect that if somebody assaults us or defrauds us, we can complain to the police, charges mm. can be laid, all those things. Mm. And the notion that if somebody defrauds you online or if you are um, defamed or if other things happen to you online, you don't have the protection of the rule of law, right. Uh, citizens just regard it as a completely that unacceptable was never going to cut proposition. It, was it? No. And, and furthermore, the proposition that parents would accept that their children right. um, uh, could uh, would have no protections available to them online uh, was completely untenable. Mm. But as you rightly point out, it's a very complex issue for sovereign governments mm. because the internet uh, really uh, is about breaking down physical barriers and borders. It's about um, uh, where those packets move most efficiently. And so that raises some very tricky issues. So I come back to the point I made that governments approach this, approach this with a real lack of confidence mm. in the 90s, mm. I would say now looking back in retrospect. And let me mention particularly the uh, provisions of the Broadcasting Services Act, Schedules 5 and 7, which deal with the regulation of uh, content online, material that if it were in other contexts would be rated X or refuse classification. Mm. So we've always accepted that there needs to be the classification of content that's delivered, films, TV, newspapers, it's an important uh, consumer protection mechanism um, and it's about, uh, for example, age-appropriate content right. and so on. The internet created huge challenges for that. Mm -hmm. And so the approach that was taken with those two schedules to the Broadcasting Services Act was to draw a sharp distinction between what the legal position was for material hosted onshore in Australia and for what was hosted offshore. And that was not a very effective regulatory strategy no. because of all the, the stuff that you're worried about in the main is hosted offshore. Sure. Um, now, if you think back to the, I think the mental model we all had of the internet in the 90s, it was, it was going to be a world in which there were millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of websites that hosted content you needed to assume as a lawmaker that um, they were based in Burkina Faso or Sierra Leone or Kazakhstan or a number of places where enforcing an Australian court judgment might be challenging. Mm -hmm. And so there was this essential lack of confidence, you know, it's almost impossible to regulate. Now what's happened in the intervening 20 years is that the market structure has developed in a way I think people did not predict. So that if you look at where most Australians are going most of the time online, mm. it's to global giants like Facebook, like Google, 
uh, uh, Twitter, um, uh, Instagram, which of course a Facebook subsidiary, and so on. Uh, and of course, the ACCC has just had a very careful look at these issues with its 600-page plus digital platforms report. Mm. But my point is that what's ended up happening is that the great majority of interactions Australians are having online, in the consumer space at least, are on uh, platforms operated by large publicly listed American companies uh, which uh, need to comply with the rule of law uh, in the US and, and with the laws of respected jurisdictions like Australia in which they operate. That has led to a recognition by governments that the practicalities of regulating the internet are perhaps not as daunting as we once thought, right. and that perhaps we can meet citizens' expectations that there is a framework uh, for safety um, and for uh, protection of reputation and so on. And so the kind of laws that we've introduced in Australia over the last 5, 10, 15 years um, uh, do um, now seek to provide protections for citizens as they go online. And in the main, um, uh, it's now, I think, pretty well accepted as a legal proposition that uh, it's an uncontested proposition, really, that law-abiding businesses that happen to operate digital platforms will comply with the laws of the duly elected government in the countries where they are operating. Right. So th that's a slightly long-winded answer, but it is really interesting to think back to the way these issues were being considered in the 90s and where we are now, um, we have seen a significant evolution, not just in Australia but globally. And at a recent G20 meeting, um, there was an adoption of this principle that the rule of law must apply online as offline. Uh, and again, that really reflects uh, the expectations that citizens have mm. of their governments right. that politicians in every country are responding to. That, that the citizens have a, a reasonable and legitimate expectation that the government will perform the traditional role That's of government, right. notwithstanding the inherent sort of idiosyncrasies yes. of the medium. Yes. Uh, and, and that leads me to um, another observation, really, that as industry, and you know that as when you were with Optus, mm. you were members of the Internet Industry mm. Association, we worked very collaboratively together around empowerment programs mm. that were not driven by government. Yep. They may have been driven in response to sort of concerns of government. Yes. But I think um, you would agree, I'm sure, that the industry has a role to play of course. in this environment because one thing I remember Paul Toomey telling me when he just assumed the mantle at ICANN, he said the thing that governments around the world are coming to recognise is that the tra traditional communication platforms are no longer held by governments mm. and one of the products of deregulation and yep. divestiture as yep. it were of the public assets particularly the telcos yep. was that you no longer have the controls the levers yep. that you but, traditionally but, but there's also a new set of issues to deal with for example 30 years ago the notion that anybody who wanted to could effectively do the equivalent of buying billboards mm -hmm. all around every city and posting on those billboards intensely defamatory messages about an individual who they had a falling out with. Mm. That was just impossible. Could not have happened. It could not have happened. Right. The internet now enables that to happen. Every one of us can at zero cost mm. uh, make available, at least potentially, mm. to an audience of hundreds of millions or billions of people uh, messages uh, about others which may or may not be uh, defamatory or abusive, uh, etc. Uh, in the main, most of us don't do that, but uh, a small number of us do, mm. and uh, that can be extremely distressing for those who are the recipient of it. So that's a new set of issues we've got to deal with. Mm. But I want to make this very important point. Uh, a very key motivation for the Australian government and I think other governments in uh, establishing regulatory frameworks for the internet is to maintain public confidence in it mm. and to ensure that uh, we all continue to have access to this quite extraordinary resource. It is 
the way that it's changed our lives and enriched our lives is phenomenal. It, it, it's, it's so staggering that it's very hard to describe it, and it's particularly very hard to describe it to a 20-year-old. Mm -hmm. You know, I had this conversation uh, with a young liberal who works in my office a year or two ago, and I talked about when you're in Economics 1, writing an essay on the budget, and your lecturer would set the essay topic and you had to go and get the budget paper. So I'd say, well, the first thing you do is you get a closed reserve in the library, and you'd book the two-hour slot where you could get one of the five copies of the budget papers, and then you'd go and frantically spend two hours photocopying before you could even start to work on your essay. So why just get it online? Okay, let's start again. <laughs> that uh, world of information abundance that we now live in mm. is something that today's kids take for granted. But for those of us who've seen that abundance arrive in our adult lifetime, it's been remarkable. No, it's nothing short of a miracle. Absolutely. They talk about, you know, what percentage of the world's knowledge yeah. will become online and, you know, there's projects like Gutenberg yes. where they're trying digitising the world's books and archives and libraries and art materials yeah. and everything. And uh, I think no one can dispute the... Um, I mean, there really hasn't been a time in human history that, that's a, perhaps the invention of the printing press, mm. but this leaves that in the dust, really. It, it does, and, and, and the way that it has reached so many people so quickly, and again, I come back to the role of the smartphone, mm. actually, mm. and, um, you know, examples uh, are put to me all the time. Just the other day, I had executives from a big US satellite company talking about one of the products they're offering in, in South America uh, which is effectively using the satellite connectivity as a backbone into um, uh, local radio uh, networks for internet access and people uh, access them using low-cost smartphones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you replicate that story around the world, millions and millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people have access to abundant information mm -hmm. in a way that um, was, was a privilege for only a, a, a tiny few 20 or 30 years ago. So the way the internet has democratised democratized. the availability of information is remarkable. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that um, uh, it, the, the internet is used for things that are, uh, encompass the full spectrum of human interests, humans in all of our messy glory. Um, uh, <laughs> That's a nice expression. Um, but uh, it, it's it's been just the most extraordinary. What a wild ride! Yes, and, and really, I think speaking on behalf of both of us, really a privilege, absolutely, to have been mm. part of this mm. as we look back in time in history. And, and one of the things that I've noticed as well is that the changes keep coming, mm. and one of them that's very topical at the moment, for example, is the explosion of. Uh, streaming video, mm. um, escort services, subscription video on demand, VVOD, so the broadcast video on demand, so the uh, free to air networks striking back, as it were, um, uh, user generated content, YouTube uh, and other video, uh, all of that enabled, I might say, in significant measure by the NBN because mm. we're now a nation where over 10 million premises can have. Uh, uh, connect to a network which offers a uh, peak speed of 25 megabits per second if you're on satellite, 50 and you're, if you're on fixed wireless, and if you're on fixed, 90% of people can get 50, many can get 100. Mm. And so what that means is the those offering a streaming video service know that a very large percentage of the population can access it. Mm. It's interesting if you go back only 10 years... I was going to say no, that wasn't the case. No. Part of the advocacy that we did in our respective roles yeah. again we had the vision yes. of what a future Australia back then could look like. And yes. I remember when we were writing the targets in 2006 and doing a comparative mm. study on where Australia sat vis-a-vis, -vis, albeit not geographically comparable yes. economies, but the South Koreas yeah. and the Japans. And the arguments we were making were around what advanced services would look like, not yes. just video, but yes. even telehealth and yes. all those other things. Uh, I mean, it's been a phenomenal commitment of respective governments mm. to to adopt that vision and, and now with you and your portfolio 
to be driving ahead with the deployment of what mm. is, I, I, I was saying to Michael Malone yesterday, mm. that, that, that I believed it was, um, at least in per capita terms, the largest ever nation building infrastructure program in Australia's history. He tried to say the Snowy Mountain scheme was more, but perhaps we can fact check that through your department. <laughs> but I'd like to think that that, was, that that really has been a historic commitment, mm. albeit started by the previous government, but nevertheless, I mean, I think there's largely bipartisan support now for this vision. Well, we, we want to yeah, be a connected we, we, we came to power in 2013 with a commitment that we would deliver the NBN. Mm. Um, when we came to government, about 50,000 premises connected. So mm. we're now at 6 million. Mm. So uh, we've, we've driven it really hard. Yes. Um, and there's, so with the rollout completing next year, the priority is, uh, leveraging this for the economic and social advantage that right. it was designed to deliver. Right. Things like how do we get more small businesses using the NBN and, for example, uh, using cloud mm -hmm. to uh, cloud-based services to operate their businesses more efficiently. I came mm -hmm. across a fantastic example a few weeks ago, um, Abode New Homes, it's a home builder in Darwin. Their entire business is in the cloud. Quite a, it's, I guess, 20 employees or so, mm -hmm. uh, but their designs are online. You convert the design to the kind of bill of materials, you do your ordering, they schedule the subbies to come to the site using um, uh, you know, cloud-based tools, um, they line up the uh, delivery of the, uh, you know, the, the toilet and the sink comes onto the site the day the plumber's uh, uh, scheduled to be there and so on, and they require their subcontractors to use the same tools so that the productivity benefits are being uh, sort of pushed through the industry. Yeah. So, now that depends upon ubiquitous connectivity. So mm -hmm. they've got 100 megabit uh, per second down, 40 megabit per second up uh, NBN plan. And indeed they're franchising uh, to somebody in North Queensland. And the reason they can do that is because there's NBN there as well. Right. And, it, and part of the, fran the proposition of the franchisee is uh, our use these online systems. So, uh, or things like the footprint, the physical footprint, where you can now live and operate a home-based business, or not necessarily home-based business, but if you're a graphic designer or an architect or any one of the myriad categories of jobs that mm. need high bandwidth. Knowledge-based. Exactly. Yeah, well, and, and mm. you know, I remember doing some work when I was at Optus, probably about 2005, 2006, meeting a bunch of people in Lismore, mm. so which is what, an hour and a half, two hours drive from Brisbane, mm complaining that they could not get fixed line broadband at all. Mm. Not that the speeds were poor, but there when was, was this? about 2006. Yeah. And in fact, I went back and looked at the numbers the other day. Um, in 2010, there were about 700,000 households that could not get fixed line broadband. Uh, in my book, I cited uh, some work that the South Australian government did in 2008 to encourage wireless-based internet service providers uh, because about 50,000 premises in Adelaide, according to their numbers, could not get ADSL. Right. So I think it's one of the things that uh, we've very quickly forgotten, that uh, it was the case that there were significant footprints of people who could not get any anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you, one of the paradoxes is you had people who'd been on the Optus or Telstra HFC footprint uh, who could get uh, even then, 10 or 20 megabits per second, depending upon what the product was, but mm. the, the physical capability was mm. there. Uh, so that um, physical footprint is a very important picture of the continued, or a very important element of the continued democratisation of the internet and the continued uh, increase in the capacity for all of us to use it uh, for greater economic participation as well as all of the social benefits. Of right. I just want to finish, and, mm. and that, that is just such a... I know whenever I talk to you, um, the thoroughness of the understanding comes through, and you talked about the book that you've written mm. that we will be giving away, actually copies on the night, um, The Wired Brown Land, mm. and, uh, and I think a very advanced and, uh, and uh, really detailed piece of analysis around what needed to happen. Mm. And, and you've articulated well 
you know, the progress that's been made since you wrote that, and that would have been written in about 2000 and... It was published in 2009, and I probably finished writing it December 2008, January 2009. Right. Yeah. So I want to just turn quickly now, and, and I mean, as the Minister, clearly your, um, your mandate is, and the imperative is to deliver on the government's existing programs, mm -hmm. and obviously we're trying to get more uptake of the mm -hmm. NBN usage, as you described. Do you ever permit yourself to dream a little, to think ahead, maybe not what the next 30 years will be like, because that would seem almost impossible, but five or 10 years? I mean, where do you think we'll be as a nation uh, and as a society in using the internet? Uh, look, I think we're going to see continued development of the physical infrastructure. One of the things the NBN has delivered is the fact that we've got uh, whatever it is, about 1.5 million premises with fibre all the way to the home. And with fibre to the curb, that's within 140 metres. In many cases, it's more like 10 or 20 metres. Fibre to the node, kilometre or so. So we pushed fibre very deep into the access network. I think we'll continue to see um, uh, that progression. And indeed, NBN has in its uh, most recent um, corporate plan about four and a half billion dollars of capex over the next four years for continued network upgrades. Things like um, GFast, which will deliver uh, better speeds, uh, has the potential to deliver better speeds for those in the fibre of the node and fibre to the curb footprints. Uh, DOCSIS 3.1 to increase the speed over the HFC network. Um, so I think that's one thing we'll see. I think we'll see, uh, obviously 5G mm -hmm. is, uh, is a big part of the story in terms of, again, uh, much higher speeds over mobile, but also um, uh, much lower latency and much higher device density. Mm -hmm. So really underpinning Internet of Things type applications. And I think uh, we're going to see in some industries that are very important in Australia, uh, continued adoption of uh, Internet of Things enabled technologies and ways of doing business. So in agriculture, for example, soil moisture monitors, um, uh, devices to target where water goes, um, uh, and... Environmental management. In, indeed. Um, bushfire management. Well, absolutely. But mm. even things like um, uh, monitoring mangoes as to when they're ripe. Right. So yeah. I think huge amounts, there'll, there'll be an explosion of sensors mm. um, uh, to gather together data and to support decision-making processes, so supported by artificial intelligence. In mining, Australia is obviously a world leader already in remote, uh, remotely operated vehicles on mines. I mean, Rio Tinto and, and BHP have mines that are almost completely remotely operated. Uh, you know, Rio Tinto has this extraordinary centre in uh, at Perth Airport. Where they've got about 300 people sitting there. Uh, effectively remotely running mines, including the big uh, rail systems and so on. Uh, but I think we're going to see more of that, and I think the internet, again, is going to make that sort of technology more affordable for smaller businesses. Mm. Um, so I think uh, that'll be a, a, a major a development over coming years. And I think what we'll continue to see then is the uh, progression of the physical Footprint. So if I take mobile coverage, you know, even today, only 31% of the Australian landmass mm. has mobile mm. coverage. Mm. Uh, my wife and I recently uh, had a week's holiday and we drove from Uluru to Alice Spring. It's a fantastic drive, 450 kilometres. That whole trip, there's, there's uh, four mobile base stations. Um, one at Yulara, the resort at, um, at Uluru. One at Curtin Springs, about 130 kilometres east. One where you hit Stewart Highway at the roadhouse there, and then the next base station you hit is, is you're just coming into Alice Springs. Now, um, uh, the economics of building base stations there are very challenging, I understand that, but my point is um, there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of the country that uh, doesn't have terrestrial mobile coverage. Of course, we now have ubiquitous satellite coverage, and that's, that's a very big deal, mm. um, but uh, I think there's, there's, we've got such a big country, 7.7 .7 million square kilometres, there's still more work to do in rolling out um, the physical network mm. over which all the, all the other layers uh, operate.
And did you have coverage on that whole trip or with those four base stations? Well, no, that's my point. Right, so there no, were the, big holes. Very in big holes. Right, now, I see. Now, um, uh, there, were, there were a lot of cars travelling that road, peak tourist period mm. in, in, in winter, right. visiting all the rooms. So if there'd been an accident or something sure. like that? Yeah, yeah. Would, you, you would have had to flag down a car, right. ask them to take a message to the next point where there was communication. Now, 30 years ago, that was life. Mm. But um, most of us in, in the populated parts of Australia assume there is near ubiquitous mobile coverage. Right. And of course, if you think about tourists coming to Australia, um, uh, you know, you fly into Melbourne or Sydney or Brisbane Airport, hire a car, drive two or three hours west, and you suddenly find yourself where you, you're in there and there's no mobile coverage. Mm. That's a huge shock for Frightening. tourists from yeah. Japan or Korea or China. They've, they've never experienced that before. So that is that is one of the... Mm. Um, so, so I think that, that is part of what needs to happen to the underlying physical network. Mm. Um, the last thing I'd say is I think we will see continued innovation in business models based upon the internet's uh, a connectivity um, and very cost-effective way of, of engaging. Mm. I talked recently, uh, you know, I talked earlier about streaming and how streaming uh, subscription video on demand has exploded in the last three years. It's now over 50% of Australian households have an escort service. It was, um, I think, 10% or so mm. three years ago. Mm. That's, that's um, a very big change, and I think we're going to see lots more new business models continuing to uh, disrupt sectors that to, to date have remained relatively undisrupted. Mm. And again, I, I suppose I'd make the point, if you think about the smartphone, what that enabled, you know, um, Uber as a business model can't work without a smartphone. It's the connectivity but the mobility and the fact that um, it becomes a very efficient way to dispatch a vehicle to you. Uh, and they were, you know, they, they saw the opportunity, jumped on it, and of course other services as well. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll make one other observation. In my previous portfolio, urban infrastructure, I had some exposure to the future of uh, automated vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, my own view is I think we're still quite some years away mm -hmm. from automated vehicles being ubiquitous. But what I do think we'll increasingly see happen is the use of uh, computer processing power to manage flows of traffic. Mm. At the moment, it's, there's only very limited capability to do that, so-called smart motorways, which, um, as you know, have, have signage to vary the speed limit depending upon the traffic levels. It's counterintuitive, but as you get closer to full capacity on a motorway, you actually get greater throughput mm. if you drop the speed from 100 to 80 to 60. Now, at the moment, how do you do that? With a, with a, with a sign, mm. uh, with, with, with big electronic signs. That's not super efficient, but no. we're getting more and more connected vehicles, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to see um, processing power used to um, shape where traffic goes, mm. and we'll see, I think, probably vehicles operating in automated mode some of the time right. and manually driven at other times. So you're putting intelligence back into the vehicle yes, and that then interacts with the road that you're yes. on, that particular road. And I've seen uh, similar things, I think, some proof of concept ideas where you can actually run cars closer together yes. at speed absolutely, because you don't have the risk of collision now yes. Yes. relying so on the human. Th that, that's right. So, that, mm. so what, um, what is uh, the limiting factor at the moment, as you say, is the human reaction time to break, mm. which means vehicles have to be, say, three seconds apart. Right. If you have vehicles um, in a so-called uh, uh, peloton, mm. um, electronically connected, then they can be, um, uh, you can use the road capacity more efficiently. Mm. So some of this stuff um, is very much um, on the dividing line between is, is it internet, is it communications technology, but it's all coming together mm. and that's I think what we're going to continue to see. Mm. Um, so my closing prediction is I think the rate of change over the next 30 years is going to be at least as fast as the last <laughs> Hang on for the ride. Exactly. Well Paul Fletcher, thank you so much Thanks again. So. Um, very excited again that you'll be speaking at the event, 30igala.com.au. Uh, some books to give away on the night. And we're going to have a bit of fun. We'll remember some of the pioneers and 
and some of the important developments that have brought us the internet as we now know it. So thank you, Paul, and we'll see you on the 31st of October. Wonderful.